Father, it completely boggles our mind that Jesus would sit down with a crew of people that would all abandon him and yet have a passionate desire to eat with them. Father, you have picked us from all parts of the world, all parts of society, and in our human flesh, you have desired to eat with us, fellowship with us, meet with us, and love us regardless of our humanness. And we return glory to your name. Father, you just let your word land in whatever heart or mind that you have designed it for this morning. And we thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, yes. Oh, uh, Lauren, um, we, we, need to, we need to try and see if we could resurrect that grace song. You know, grace, radical grace, amazing grace, scandalous grace. It's gone off the top ten. We have to do something about that. <laughs> it's... it's uh, yeah, I'll help you with the song selections, and be it's all right. <laughs> Amen. Grace. Wonderful, amazing grace. Amen. Amen. Gra- we, we, could, we could talk about uh, so many aspects of grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. We could talk about so definitions, but there really is no real definition of grace. You, you can't put it into words. Amen. And, and uh, so th- this morning, uh, the, the title, uh, which will be uh, coming up on, on the screen, will be The Gospel of Grace motiv- by, Motivated by Unfathomable Love. Um, some things have been boiling, and of course, uh, I've been traveling, been away somewhat, but um, I've just been so enjoying being able to be here and, and the ministry of this church. And Pastor Lottie is such an incredible uh, gift to the church, isn't he? And, and the, the revelation he brings. And uh, I, I said to him a number of times, boy, I wish I could put it together at the speed you do, so contextually, so beautifully, and yet land so powerfully. And uh, so I'm sorry, but I won't be bringing it like that this morning. And, uh, but, but whatever way the Holy Spirit wants to say uh, in our lives today. Amen? Amen. Verse of Scripture, we're going to read a couple of Scriptures. For who has known the mind of the Lord... Or who has ever been his counselor? Have you ever tried that? I've counseled God numbers of times. And he said, I don't care what titles you got, you're not good at it. <laughs> I never get it right. Uh, and it's been a waste of time. It doesn't stop you trying. Who has ever first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, all things, all things, all things. Amen. Amen. To whom be the glory forever and forever. Uh, J.B. Phillips, who wrote the uh, great little translation of the New Testament, he, he writes this little masterful book, and he says, your God is too small. Uh, I don't have the book, but I have uh, read this part. And one of the things that he does in that, he does it in, uh, talks about it in photographic terms. And he talks about how limited we are in the way that we are seeing God. And he said, it's like a camera. You look through a camera and you see a certain picture. You don't see everything, but you see only what you can see through the lens. When we look at God, we look through the lens of a camera. What we see is God but it's not all God. We will never, ever capture the amazing... I am amazed and staggered, and the more and older I become, I am amazed at the grace of God. I just finished a most amazing week with folks from from interstate. A block booking going flat out all week. You know, my goodness. You see, I'm watching grace-taking happening, grace in people's lives. Amen. I, I love the job I do because I love rolling my arms up and my, uh, my sleeves in my arms. I, 
I, I do, and, and just working at people's life, no matter where they are, how far down they have gone, what's happened to them is to watch the resurrection Christ at work and working in their lives. Amen. Amen. And another one of it, uh, Francois de uh, Detroit, he, he says this, and I like you to hear this. I think I've put it on the screen too. Uh, any idea you might have theologically about God that is unlike Jesus is not God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. This is not necessarily a Christmas message, but let me say this. I am so glad this morning that Jesus came in a human body. Amen. Amen. That God visited us in a human body. He visited us in our weakness. He visited us in our distress. He visited us just the way we were. And this morning, one of the most incredible things is he still keeps coming to us the way we are. Amen. He meets me and he meets you the way we are. We're not all in the same place. We're not all thinking the same thing. We don't all have the same issues. We don't have the same problems. We don't have the same grief. We don't have the same things going on in our lives. But oh, what's so amazing about it is that Jesus knows every suffering. He knows every heartache. You just imagine as that beautiful, that was fantastic this morning at the, at, at the breaking of bread. That was a great man because he's sitting passionately. Could you put yourself in that kind of a bush? He says, of course we could not. He's sitting passionately and his foremost desire is to sit with people that's going to walk away as soon as he gets in trouble and yet knows the pain he's going to be in. Knows the suffering is going to be in. Boy, if we were in that position, we, could you pray for me? Would you just all pray for me? I'm going to be suffering soon, and I need your prayers. All he wanted to do was eat. <laughs> Amen. Hey, it was really interesting last week. I had some in cooking, and I thought, boy, this is really interesting last week. And then it turned out the same this morning. Because I was listening last week to Pastor Mel, and, and, and uh, she was saying that Luke was her favorite gospel. That was right, wasn't it? And Luke was her favorite. That's qu quite amazing, because the table of the Lord is about Luke, and my message is about Luke. And so you see, now that's really important, and I'm going to highlight some things that Luke brings to the table, and why I think it's one of the most beautiful gospels, because Luke is known as the gospel of grace. Now, that's quite astounding for several reasons, but um, I was wondering if Pastor Mel just liked it because you know that, uh, and I'm sure you, you knew this, uh, but the gospel of Luke was also known as the gospel of woman. Uh, yes, I said, uh, that's why she likes it. <laughs> oh, it is the gospel to woman. Because Jesus, in an amazing way, Luke points out how Jesus brought women in and dealt with them and worked with them and set them out in the most unique way. And he absolutely brought an amazing message for women. So yes, amen. And that, that, that is very, very important. Now, Luke was a physician. He traveled with him with his little doctor's bag. He, now, being a physician, he was incredibly detailed, solution-oriented. He had been a very, very high thinker. And unlike John, who was so emotionally expressive in love, High thinkers are more prone to the rules. They're more prone to legalism and getting everything right. But this is what's so amazing, and I love it about this, is because I have worked, and I, I work in temperament therapy, of course, but one of the things that I know is people say, well, you know, I'm a thinker. I don't do like you. I don't express like you. I don't get excited like you. And you know what I really love here in watching what Luke does is because he has an incredible revelation of grace and mercy. He has the most amazing revelation, and there is not a person in this service this morning that is exactly from that kind of revelation, that we can understand his mercy, that we can understand his grace, that we can understand how Jesus, and he shows the generosity of Jesus to the poor, to the broken, to the marginalized. That's why I love what I'm doing in, in my work thing. He, he, he speaks into the abandoned and the forgotten, and he's always talking in the lookout for the lost. He talks about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and so wonderfully, he includes one of the most liberating, accepting, forgiving examples of the great heart of our Father and embracing what so many would have rejected in today's terms in the glorious parable of the lost son, which we know as the prodigal son. I, that story of the prodigal son, and we have always referred that, of course, to non-Christians, but that's for everybody. 
And one of the things that's really important that the Bible says, and Luke's bringing this out, and he says, and he went into a far country. Why did he need to say that? Why did he want to say he went into a far country? Why didn't he just go to the town next? Why didn't he just go to the next city? Why did he go to a far country? Well, there's two things. It won't be all the things, of course, but there are two things that strikes me, and that is... When you close the door and not abiding moment by moment in Jesus, you start traveling in the wrong direction and you'll go farther and farther and farther away from the blessing of the Lord. And why is that so? It's because you and I, born again, have a capacity that only God can fill. We have a vacuum that only God can fill. And because he fills it, we close the door to his life. And when we close the door to his life, then we have to look for more and more and more and more. Uh, There was an old term used. I don't agree with it. I don't like it, but I guess it, it helps people to understand. They called it backsliding. Backsliding gives a wrong inference to this. What it means, I've just closed the door to receiving from him, and through my own pride or my own unbelief, I close the door. As soon as we close the door, we go into the soul realm, and in the soul realm, we need to be satisfied. And I'll tell you, when you find Jesus, now none but Christ can satisfy. No other name for me. There's love, there's life, there's lasting joy. Lord Jesus, only found in you. Amen. He goes into a far country. He keeps going for more and more and more and more. And and the most wonderful thing about Jesus, he lets you go. We don't. We beat him up. Let's communicate them. He lets him go because God's not insecure. He's not threatened. And he lets him go. Because he sits back and he says, I desire to eat with you. You're wasting your time where you're going. You're just wasting your time. You will never be satisfied. You'll be back. You'll be back. No matter how far far you go, you'll be back. You can never go beyond the mercy and the grace of God. You can never go beyond the love of God. And that one way, as God points out, he went into a, or Luke points out in this, he went into a far country. No matter how far you go, no matter how far someone goes, you can't go beyond his love. And you'll never go beyond his grace. And you'll never go beyond his compassion. And you'll never go beyond him wanting you home, wanting you back again. Amen. And Zechariah says in Luke chapter 1 and 17, we'll have it on the board. You are my child, Uh, the prophet saying, of the highest, will go ahead of the master to prepare his ways, present the offer of salvation to his people and forgiveness of sins, for through the heart felt mercies of God. Even though they hated Jesus, even though they despised him, Jesus continued to love them. He continued to pour out forgiveness. And in this little book, in this little gospel, it is charged with forgiveness. Praise God this morning that we have a God of forgiveness. A God who continually forgives us. I I take a verse from Psalms that I do, and this is a bit of a ritual of mine. But David says in one of his Psalms, he said, Every morning he say, I lay out all the pieces of my life before you, and I just wait for your fire to fall upon my heart. Do you know what I do? I bring out every morning, and I just put all the stuff down on these little tables in my office, and I put them all down. My rubbish, my garbage, my mistakes, whatever it might be, and I put them down, and I just put them before the Lord. And I said, now, burn them up. (laughs) Just burn them up. Amen. They're going to hassle me all day, and I don't have time to be hassled. Because I need people. The people come and I need to be centered. And so, come on, please burn them up. Because they're not good. They're not helping me. They're not profitable. And yes, I made the mistake. And the enemy wants me to regurgitate them, think about them, and go over them. And I say, and let your fire burn it up. Amen. Amen. I have given that ritual of mine to some of my clients who have told me since that, it's incredibly liberating for them because they've tied stuff all the way through the day and found out they could just lay it out in the morning and get it burned up. Amen. And then you start the day. Amen. Amen. 
Yes. The part that was uh, boiling in me before was this one, uh, and, and, and going in, a little percolating time. Whereas in Luke chapter 22, and verse 31, 32, and the Lord said to Peter, Simon, Satan has tried to separate you from me, like chaff from the wheat. Do you know, that's the kind of the mission the devil's on. And the devil doesn't care whether you're an adulterer or a liar. He doesn't care whether you're a thief. He doesn't care what he's doing. All he wants to do is to separate us from the Lord. Separate us from the source. Separate us from the life. Separate us. Make us useless. Cause us not to be able to walk with freedom and walk with joy and sit down to be with the Father. And the enemy, one of his purposes is, is to get you to close the door to his life flowing through you, just like he did to Peter, and he said he's going to sift you. Listen, that's not the only person this has happened to. I've been sifted a few times. Have you been sifted? If you haven't been sifted, you will. Otherwise, you're not a very good target for the enemy, which may mean... <laughs> oh, I better not say. Anyhow, Amen. He wants to sift us, to stop our fellowship with the Father, to stop us in our walk with God, to stop us enjoying, to stop us walking with peace. He out to sift us, and he'll use any method. He knows the way you're wired. He knows your kind of temperament. He knows the way you are. He knows the right temptation. He knows the right thing to bring to try and sift you. And somehow he is completely deluded because God already knew. Nothing takes God by surprise. Amen. God already. <laughs> go on. Go on. Have a go. And then from that, oh, yes, he may blow it. And yes, he may fail. And yes, he may not do so good. And yes, they may get into the flesh. And yeah, they may. Yeah, they may. But I get the last say. Because I will use everything for my glory. No matter what it is, I will use it for my glory. We have people today that I have encountered in my travels and so on. They're always beating the devil up, and they're always in warfare with the devil, and they're always doing stuff to the devil. I don't have time for that. And I just say to them, I said, hey, I'm flat out keeping my eyes on Jesus. I don't know how you got time to get your eyes on the enemy. Because I'm flat out keeping them on Jesus. And not only that, I know what he, God knows what he's up to. Oh, I get caught, I get deceived, I fall into the mess, I fall into the ship. Grace, wonderful grace. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And Jesus said, he is going to have a go at you and it's going to be bad. You know what I love about that? I don't like it about it in my own life though. But Jesus said, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Please pray I don't fail. I don't like failing. Do you like failing? Oh, of course not. Who likes failing? Anybody at all been in failure? <laughs> of course, your laugh gives you away. But anyhow, the fact is, well, oh, I'll put my hand up and you can sit there. But the fact is, we get any failure. Why did Jesus not just say, I'll pray you don't fail? Because his prayer would have worked. May I say this to you today, we may not like this, but our failure has been part of the plan. And God has permitted failure. And I'll tell you for me, and I only confess this for me, if I would not gone through failure, if I would not experienced failure, I'd be a big head. I would, I'd be a big head. I remember when I first was pastoring, people would tell me about their problems and tell me about things they're going through. And I used to hit them on the shoulder and say, come on, you know what the Bible says, rejoice. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Can you get it together? <laughs> in Psalm 6, God says to me, the God that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Oh, he's laughed at me a few times. 
my stupid arrogance and pride that I think that I could have done it. And God says, okay. The fact is, Peter would never have ever, ever did what God called him to do without factoring failure into the plan. Did you get that? Well, have a little look at yourself. He features the failure. He features the distress. He features the issues. He features the problems. He features them into the plan. Into the plan. Absolutely. I prayed that your faith doesn't fail. That's what's most significant about this, which we'll visit in a moment. <clears throat> How are we doing? I, I, I don't, I'm okay, I'm, I need it because I'm only about halfway through. I'm all right? I, nobody's saying anything. <laughs> hey, listen. So listen, if you fall, fall forward. If you fall, fall forward. The enemy wants you to fall back. Push you away from God and let you fail your bit. No. The, the most crucial thing in this passage will be about that verse in Luke and why it's so profound to me. Adam, see, Adam in the garden, he blows it. Oh, you know what? If Adam had some more moral fiber in him, if he had been a better character, if he had been a lot stronger, why did God make Adam to create our problems? He got it all wrong. <laughs> Adam was always going to fail. Because Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. It was all in the plan. Because you and I have to be people to make choices as well. Amen? To walk in those choices. And, but he fails... He blows it. And what does he do? He does exactly what I have done, and I'm sure you have done it. He goes away and he hides. And then he hides, and God comes looking for him, as though God didn't know where he was. And God comes looking for him and says, well, where are you? And he says, well, I was naked, and I hid myself. Have you ever noticed that when you get it wrong, when you blow it, if you sin, if you go really down... Have you noticed that the first thing you want to do is run from God? Hide from God. I can't stand to be in a holy place. <laughs> I'm not praying this morning. Oh, no. I'm not praying this morning, God. Oh, I know. No, I'm, I'm so naked. Oh, it's horrible being naked before God. And, and sitting down there realizing in my worst. Do you know that when you are ashamed in your worst, it is proof that you're being pride in your best? If you're ashamed at your worst, it'll be proof that you will be proud in your success. What keeps our feet on the ground and recognize our need for God's grace is his glorious, amazing praying for me, my faith to be strong. Amen. Jesus consistently was concerned with the healing of human shame, fear, guilt, leading to his final full identification with all that shame. You know, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, condemned he stood. Hey, how horrible is it? Even when we were at school, we talked, I'm shaming you out. You're going to get shamed out. Shame is a horrible thing, is it not? Of course, it's the other side of the coin of pride. But he took our shame. He bore our shame. Jesus hung on the cross naked before the world, the Son of God, and he hung naked. And you couldn't be any worse than be naked up before the whole world, exposed to everything you are. And Jesus took our shame, and he bore our shame that we would not be shamed. Amen. Shame, it's a horrible, destructive thing. And boy, the people I've got working with me, the shame, the utter shame. And they leave because Jesus was already shamed and they can lift their head up. Amen. God doesn't love us because we're good. God loves us because he's good. 
Amen. It's not a wonderful blessing. Those things that Satan has designed for my destruction in the hand of God, they work together for good. Amen. You know, I've heard this. There's no condemnation of anybody saying this, but it's been trafficked through theology about King David. And I hear people, they talk about King David, and they talk about David's failure. And David, he took this woman who was absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. She certainly was a heterosexual man. And now David looks at her, and he sees her, and she's absolutely beautiful. And he takes her and gets her pregnant. And she's another man's wife. And then kills off her own husband to cover the whole thing up. Do you know that one of the most insidious things in that story, when I hear that Preach sometimes. He should have been at war. And he should have been busy. Let me make something very, very clear to you. Being busy will not keep you from trouble. And being busy is not equal victory. The little boy is fishing by the lake. And he fell in. And he's getting himself out when this guy walks past and he looks at him and he said, Sonny, he said, how did you come to fall in? He said, I didn't come to fall in. He said, I came to fish. And while I was fishing, I fell in. You can be as busy as busy. You can be at war. You can be doing what you know you need to do. You can be full on. I tell you, sometimes the greater the activity, the more close you are to temptation and the more possibilities you are to burn out. It's about resting. See, here's what's missed. I don't hear this, but here's what's missed about that story. <clears throat> Bathsheba was the name of the lady. David takes her to be wife. The baby that she was pregnant with first dies, which is another revelation by itself. And then who does she have? Solomon. And now Solomon is born into this union that we have condemned him for. And we say, oh, it changed the whole course of history. Of course it changed history because it's not the negative history it changed. It changed the whole history that through Solomon, Jesus would be born. It was the lineage of God. It was the lineage of Jesus. So from David through Solomon, which was the union with me, I want to tell you something. You're, it hurts us, and it pains us, and it's difficult for us, and we don't handle it well. But let me tell you something else. We're looking through two smaller lens. God's bigger than your failure. God's bigger than your mistake. God's bigger than anything that goes on. And the most amazing thing I have watched through my years, and I know I'm not old yet, but I will grow old, but the fact is, when I do, but one thing I know, oh, I cannot, I am staggered, I am boggled at the grace of God, completely boggled at the grace of God. Amen. Whatever things are going on, whatever things are happening, in your life, please know this. God causes all things. The issues, the problems, the people that cause you angst, the people that cause you trouble, the things that you fall into, the mistakes, the sins, no matter what happens in our lives, and we try to pray them away. The greatest problem we pray for is for deliverance. Faith is not about deliverance. Faith is walking courageously in the journey in the grace of God. Because I have seen miracles in my own eyes, real great. And I made out a whole lot more so when I was younger in the faith. But I've seen those miracles. But you know what I watch? When I watch people that have messed up, people that have failed, people that have gone and made mistakes, people that are living in pain and suffering, people, I'm staggered at the lives, some things happening in people's lives, and watching them, keeping in the faith, I prayed that your faith won't fail. See, the enemy is not interested in anything but getting out your faith. Let me tell you, no matter what you're going through, Jesus has prayed for your faith. Keep the faith. 
Stay in the faith. Know that God's working it out. It doesn't look good. It may be sad, and it may be sorrowful, and it may be painful. But here's a man who showed us that even the night before he was to suffer the most horrendous death, didn't center on his suffering. He centered on you and me. He centered on us. Oh, the devil thought he had the ice card that when Jesus was on the cross, he thought he got him. And what the devil didn't know that when he was pinned on the cross, he saved the whole world. <laughs> he, thought, he thought he had the ice card. And he completely blew it by turning the people and by causing them to stand up and do everything to him. He didn't know he was saving the whole world. Amen. Are you glad about that? That God's working in everything in your life? Listen. Don't try and separate it and blame the devil for this. And then God's in this. And then my wife's in this. And then my husband's in this. And then this is in this. Listen, I read to you originally at the very beginning, God is in all and through all and to all. And because of all things exist. Amen. Amen. Did you get that? Yeah. All spells all. A-L-L. -L. Yes? I'm going to finish... And, and I'm going to finish on one aspect that I want to read about grace. So we're going to put it on the board. I want you to look at it. And then the band will be able to come and we will be able to play those beautiful songs. Grace, wonderful grace. Am I, no, it's okay. It's right <laughs> Are you doing all right? Amen. Are you not glad this morning that it's Christmas and God came in the flesh? And that you and I have the privilege this morning of knowing that all of our pain, all of our suffering, everything that we're going through this morning, no matter what it may be and how painful it might be, he's with you. He's the comforter. He's the healer. He's the strength. He's the deliverer. He's the joy. He's the peace. Let's hang in with him and listen. Recognize the devil's only after your faith. Just trust in him. Amen. One thing we're going to put in. Oh, he's got it up already. <clears throat> Yeah. Do you like this? It is grace. It remains grace. Good works won't, good works won't bring it in, and bad works won't hinder it. Otherwise, grace is not grace. If I'm better, then I'm more grace. Do you know, for my job, and what I work in, and what I do, I watch constantly the amazing grace of God in the lives of people. And here's finishing off, but here's one thing. I don't care where somebody is because Jesus knew what they would all do and what Peter would do. It didn't matter to him. He reached them where they were. He reaches you where you were. I don't care where people are at when they come to see me. There's no judgment, no condemnation, because Luke taught me all about the life of Jesus and compassion and love and mercy and care and all the weightier things of the law. And the delight is watching God's grace bring them out of their suffering, out of their pain, out of their mess, out of their failure, and lift up their head and bring joy and peace and love. Hey, thank you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you.